I would love for all of you to join me in an exercise. So I'm going to ask you to stand up one more time. All over the room. Thank you so much. And I need you to trust me on this. Close your eyes. Take a half a step away from your chair. You got to close your eyes now, no peeking. Now I want you to imagine that the chair you were just sitting on could no longer hold you. I want some of you to even imagine that the chair you were just sitting on is no longer there. You have that image in your mind? Okay, open your eyes, sit back down. <laughs> I saw some of you guys hesitating like, I don't know. I saw one person actually just stuck sitting there like that. <laughs> the feeling of not being supported is uncomfortable and it's scary. If you had to check to see if that chair was there and you had to check to see if you could sit on that chair and you had to do this every day, it would naturally cause anxiety. The absence of security causes weariness in the soul. The trepidation that you just felt is the troubling sensation that our education system has created for so many kids. As a society, we cannot continue to ask children to sit on seats that are not designed to hold the weight of their purpose. You see, we must rethink what that seat looks like. Parent, student, school, and community must become the four legs of a new chair supported by the frame of moral equity. And until all four parts of that chair are working together, reinforced by that moral frame, we will not have a strong enough chair for our children to be educated on. I suggest to you that a great education is possible for every child. However, this idea requires broader support to work properly. If we don't get that support from every segment of our society, we will not have an education system that works for every child. Now, I must admit, I was completely unaware of the conditions of our education system for many years. And I was totally ignorant of the challenges in trying to reform that system. You see, I'm not an educator. I just play one on TV. I'm a pastor of an amazing church in the great city of Baltimore. Baltimore is located in the mid-Atlantic region of our country, nestled between New York and Washington, D.C. And it wasn't until 2012 that my eyes were open when I was asked to convene a meeting of faith leaders to see if there was interest amongst our group to connect with our local schools. At that meeting, our host, the Maryland Campaign for Achievement Now, began to share data with me that was inconceivable. They broke down the demographics of our city schools. They told us that we had approximately 86,000 students, among which 46% were African-American male. And out of that subgroup, only 9% were proficient in reading, 9%. 46% African-American male is almost half of our student body population. And out of that group, 91% of them were not reading on their proper grade level. 91%.
The information that they shared wasn't just focused on deficiencies, it was also focused on hope and opportunity. They also shared information about schools that were defying the impossible. They called these schools opportunity schools because these schools afforded children from low-income households as well as higher-income households the opportunity to succeed. These particular schools, seven elementary public schools, one public middle school, were consistently leading children to outperform overall state proficiency rates. So I said to myself, I want to visit some of these schools. So I did. I met some incredible, dedicated leaders, exceptional teachers and principals, some amazing students. Conversely, then, I wanted to go and visit schools that were not giving children the opportunity to succeed, to see how they worked, to make sure we're not replicating that model throughout our city. Let's figure out what works and replicate that model throughout all of Baltimore. As I visited this one particular school that was not allowing children to succeed, it created a seminal moment for me. We got to go into a third grade classroom. Immediately, I noticed a young man standing in the back corner of the room. I said to myself, there's no way that we are still making kids stand in the corner for disciplinary reasons. So out of curiosity, I wanted to engage with this young man. So I walked over to him, I got down on one knee and I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, how you doing? My name is Michael Phillips. The response that I got from the young man was not the response I thought I was gonna get. This young man turned around, bright eyed and brilliant, looked me in the eye, shook my hand, he said, hi, my name is Calvin. I said, hey Calvin, how are you? He says, I'm good. I said, are you joining your class today? He says, yes. I said, what are you guys learning? He said, well, this is social studies and we're learning about history. This is my favorite class. I said, oh man, that's awesome. I said, Calvin, let me ask you a question. Why are you standing up in the corner? And Calvin looked at me with those bright and brilliant eyes and said, because my chair is broken. I said, excuse me? He said, my chair is broken. He then pointed to the chair and said, every time I sit in that chair, I fall. And when I fall, I get into trouble. So I'd rather just stand in the corner and do my work. For whatever reason, I got down on the floor in my nice suit. And I started to try to fix this chair feverishly. I noticed immediately that the chair was old and worn. And it was built to be adjustable. And the four legs on the chair weren't sturdy because the frame that connected the four legs were bent and broken. One of the four legs was stuck in the up position, and so I started tugging on it and pulling on it, and somehow it popped out. I was able to adjust it a little bit and set it up a little bit higher, and then I looked at Calvin and said, hey, I fixed your chair. Calvin grabbed his things, ran over, sat in that seat, gave me a big smile, and stuck his chest out like he was ready to soar. I walked out of that classroom and I had an epiphany. I said to myself, I can fix chairs. <laughs> I got halfway down the hall and here comes Calvin running down the hall. I hear him screaming my name, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips. I turn around, I see it's Calvin and he's running fast as he possibly can and he gets close to me and leaps into my arms and says, thank you for fixing my chair. I said, oh, buddy, you're welcome. And then he looked at me with those brilliant bright eyes and said, now can you help me fix my school? I looked at Calvin and said, I'm gonna get to work on it. He ran back to class and I ran out of that room trying to figure out how I can help Calvin fix his school. Because like Calvin, when our, chairs, when our children are forced to learn on broken chairs, then they are forced to stand in the corners of our society. I started to do some homework and some research, and what I discovered, as one writer put it, the atrocious educational conditions that cause children to lose their educational lives and social and economic futures exist because we fail to teach them to read and to think adequately for these times. It was Dr. King who told us that we are now faced with the fact 
that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. Dr. King also added, we may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and it rushes on. I did a little bit more digging and I found out that over the last 30 years, some impressive changes have been made in the right direction. It was the 1983 publication, A Nation at Risk, that uncovered the state of American education and exposed what that meant for individuals and for our country. And that one document produced all types of reforms and movements. But even with all the movements and reforms over the last 30 years, not too much has moved and not too much has changed. For most families, the structure of public education remains unaffected. The chair is still broken. Education reform continues to be the civil rights issue of our time. The chair is broken because it was built by the branches of immoral policies rather than by the roots of moral clarity. The system is broken because it was never designed to educate every child. Consequently, we still have children trapped in failed geographically determined schools. The system still allows for the continuation for the school to prison pipeline. It was Frederick Douglass who told us it is easier to build strong children than to fix broken men. If these conditions don't change, our children will continue to languish until we address some of these foundational issues. Now here's the good news. Time can be redeemed. I suggest to you that we are not out of time and we are not out of options. Here are three options that we can implement right now that can make education possible for every child. Priority, people, and pace. I'm gonna say that one more time. Priority, people, and pace. The common good of educating kids must become a priority again. We need to shift our priorities. The roots of community can regrow the branches of policy. My entire congregation shifted its priorities when it partnered with a transformational school and helped it become a public charter. We made history with the largest number of people ever in the history of our education system in Baltimore to be at a charter school hearing. We shut the place down. We mobilized over 300 volunteers to be reading interventionists, tutors, mentors, and wraparound supports for schools, parents, teachers, and students. If we can shift our priority driven by our conscience, we can turn the tide for so many children and for so many families. We need more people to advocate for public education. We need more voices to advocate for high quality education. We need more people to advocate for a change in our structure and a change in our system. You do not need a degree in education to advocate for education. All you need is a voice and your voice is powerful. You can, you can urge with conviction that policymakers and school districts and every stakeholder get results now. You can do that with your voice. We can set an urgent pace because citizen advocates are the greatest disruptors to status quo. And let's face this reality right now. Status quo is the real enemy. The enemy is not the legislator. The enemy is not the teacher's union. The enemy is not the teacher. And for God's sake, the enemy is not charter schools. 
The enemy is keeping business as usual and allowing the status quo to continue. That is the real enemy. We can make it a priority to seek out the schools and the programs and the teachers and the nonprofits that are making change happen now in our communities. We can set that urgent pace together and become an unstoppable force for change. We can show up in so many places, in school districts, school hearings, school board meetings, city council meetings. We can tell the stories of those parents and teachers and students like Calvin who are on the front line of this struggle. And we can do that on social media and in blogs and in our local newspaper. We can lift our collective voices and channel our innermost Oprah and say to every child, you get an education, you get an education, everybody gets an education. And we can do this so that no child ever has to learn on a broken chair again. Thank you.